Hello and welcome to East Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we're talking about Undina. Or in English, I suppose we pronounce it Undine. Yes. But it's the name of a character in this German film, a uh, German-French film. It's a romantic fantasy drama directed by Christian Petzold, who, yes. whose last film we saw, uh, Transit, yes. which we both really liked. Yes. And that was uh, essentially a World War II uh, period drama, although the actual setting was slightly displaced in time. Mm. But it was about trying to leave a European country that was being taken over. Mm. And it was incredibly evocative, and that starred the same two uh, stars of this, mm. uh, Paul Le Beer and Franz Wagowski. Yeah. Franz Wagowski is like a German Joaquin Phoenix, the way he looks and yes, the feeling that he connects with his face and with his whole ambience. And she's she has to be the most beautiful woman in movies at the moment, actually. <laughs> so this is based on... The Undine, which I wasn't that aware of before we watched this, and I've been looking it up because I said, oh, what's Undine? I know Undine with an O. Mm. And where do I know that from? And the answer is I know it kind of from fairy tale, but it, it feels like an ancient mythological figure, and it's not quite. I think it emerged in like the 1500s, and then it was developed in literature and art in the 1800s, and things mm. like The Little Mermaid. Kind of I know it that. because there was a film, or well, it was a play by Girard II, and it was also a film with Audrey Hepburn. Mm. And it was also a ballet that Margaret Fontaine yeah. would do. It's um, been kind of used and adapted a lot. But from what I can tell from reading around it, it's not that codified. Like if you think about something like a vampire or a troll or something, those are quite codified kind of kind of figures. No, because also it's meant to be... Uh, um, you know, the Little Mermaid in the Hans Christian Andersen tale mm. is meant to be an Undine figure. Exactly. Uh, and I can't quite connect it with the angry elemental that you <laughs> Yeah, so what it is, it's an ele- elemental figure that's associated with the elements of water. If you think mm. about the four, earth, uh, water, what are the elements? Whatever they are. <laughs> Fire, air. That's it. Uh, the Undine is the one associated with water. And there are things associated with the Undine to do with love. If it comes on, it's a kind of liminal figure. It lives between the water and the land. And if it comes onto land, it can gain a soul mm. by uh, getting married to a human, this kind of thing. But these things are not that codified, from what I can tell. And this film has its own version of the way. Yeah, it's and I think works. we need to ignore all of that background actually, and kind of just begin dealing with, you know, what the film shows us, and then kind of trying to make sense of that actually. Yeah. So Undina in this, the character begins with a breakup. Her boyfriend has broken up with her at a cafe and she's very upset about it. And she leaves the conversation with the words, or she, she said to the guy as he leaves, if you leave, I'll have to kill you. Mm. Which is quite threatening. <laughs> it's a fantastic beginning, right? <laughs> she's basically saying, I have to go now, but I'll be back. You know, I have my break in half an hour. And if you're not here waiting for me, I'll have to kill you. (laughs) Yeah, and exactly what she means by that and how serious that is is not clear at the start. She means she seems to mean it quite sincerely. Yeah. She doesn't mean it as a joke. And the meaning of that ultimately becomes clear as the film develops. But she then falls into a relationship with a deep-sea diver. This is the uh, Frank Vygotsky character. Undine comes back after threatening her boyfriend uh, that if he's not there, she'll kill him. And, you know, at that very meeting, this young man comes up to her, tells her how much he loved her talk and would she like to have coffee with him. In the meantime, you know, he's very clumsy, so he he ends up pushing against the wall and a whole tank falls, on a fish tank falls on top of them. Mm. And they fall in love. And actually, I thought those scenes were absolutely marvelous, right? So they fall in love and they can't, you know, they're crazy in love and they can't stop touching each other and... You know, they're kind of communicating perfectly and the scenes are full of joy. Him walking, you know, running in the tube to, you know, to catch every last sight of her. I thought all of that was like so romantic and beautiful. And you get a sense, actually, something that it made me realize when watching it that's missing. How much of falling in love is really about tactility, about affection, about, you know, also... Uh, uh, being seen or sharing a world or a view or being understood, yeah, mm. this kind of communication 
yeah, but that is also kind of conveyed physically, yeah? You know, it's like people can't stop holding t hands or touching each other or, yeah, kind of. And I think this film does it beautifully. And actually, it's not related to sex. Yeah, I mean, there's also sex, right? But the moments that I'm talking about is just like they're walking down the street and, you know, mm. they're all curled into each other. They go diving together. And they go diving together. I mean, I think the film is beautiful at evoking that kind of falling in love, yeah? It's got an interesting thing about uh, the city. So Undina's job is to do with urban planning and she shows kind of wealthy tourists uh, these these um, sort of models of the city and what the city will be as it's developed and this mm. sort of thing. She talks them around it and there's a heavy emphasis. There are long scenes where you hear her talks you hear about her, the history of Berlin. Of Berlin, yes. Uh, and its development. Yes. Um, to, and to the point where there's a scene where, which is... A, one of the sex scenes, essentially, um, where she and the, the diver character, Christoph, mm. um, are in bed together, and he kind of spurns her physical advances and says, no, 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 I want to hear your talk that you're going to give tomorrow. And so there's this, it's, it sexualises this talk, and he hears her, and he says, oh, I like hearing you speak, you're smart, and you're kind, and, like, and, and I thought, oh, this is quite silly, and then started to understand, actually, what this character was feeling, why mm. he wanted to hear her sure. give this speech. And I thought it was interesting as well that um, there are two points in the film. One is in the talk that she gives at the start where uh, characters look at the model of that city and they recognise a place in it and then they imagine the figure that they mm. desire in it. So at the start it's the ex-boyfriend who's just split up with her. She looks at the church and she gets lost for a minute because she sees him there. Mm. Um, it kind of reminded me of, um, I think it was How I Met Your Mother... I think there was a, and it's in a comedic context because it's a sitcom. There was a, a storyline in that for an episode about a character they could no longer, that the guy could no longer hang out with. Oh, sorry, it was about places in New York City that the character could no longer go because they'd split up with someone. Mm. And they were there, that was their regular haunts. So you had this map and it had like all these areas shaded in red. I can no longer go to this neighborhood because I might see her there. Mm. And it kind of made me think about like the way that, the way that these spaces become personalised you know as mm -hmm. they do in this right so in that's comedic in this it's it's romantic the feeling of the person is just seeing the, just seeing the model of the building that they sit outside stops her in her tracks mm. that he might be there and the same goes for Christoph I think it is later on in the mm. film he imagines the same thing well I think the film has a whole narrative of the development of Berlin and the east and the west so you know, the barrier, yeah? Which can also, I think, be read as a barrier between, and you know, the water nymph and the real person. Uh, and also then the bridging of that barrier and the, the design of spaces so that um, they're fit for purpose. And, you know, kind of this whole thing about form following function in the reconstruction of the palace, yeah, that had first... Uh, been uh, destroyed in the bombs and that the communists didn't want to rebuild mm. and then that the city kind of convinced its citizens to rebuild it you know by putting up a facade an image yeah but then actually the function of it was different than what was yeah than what was originally intended so and i think the film story has to be read along those terms yeah you know the separation between nymph and people is there a space for names, can you repurpose it? <laughs> yeah, kind of. I do. Th I do think mm. that all of those things are are connected, and I'm not sure, you know, how to read the answer because, you know, what happens is that Undine sacrifices herself for the man she loves. So yeah, kind mm. of. You know, th there's a connection between her returning to the water, and him being able to breathe again, giving up her bodily form, her earthly form. Yeah, retur yeah, so mm. she sacrifices her life so for his, which actually kind of makes also more sense of uh, the ending. Yeah. yeah, so what do you make of the ending? Well, the ending is that, you know, he's wanted to do the same for her, mm. yeah, but actually she returns him their token of love so <laughs> that he can start, uh, you know, he can, he can get on with his life, which is... Yeah, with you know, his pregnant girlfriend. With his pregnant girlfriend. Mm. You know, so I think the two things are also tied with honesty and truth and deceit. 
you know, kind of uh, the ex-boyfriend is bad, not only because he left her, but because he deceives her, yeah, mm. and because he used her, and be yeah, and so on, right? Mm. And actually, uh, you know, their relationship is put at risk because of her lie, right? Yeah. So, you know, so I think those elements are also there. The direction and the tone really interested me because it has this very kind of clean look and feel to it and editing and uh, which you know it made me think like i really associate germany in quite a banal way with uh sort of coldness and efficiency and vorsprung duck technic and all that kind of stuff and not romance but of course it's like this is My the God, land of fairy tales Goethe. is where where yeah the brothers grim it's hyper romantic right exactly so like yeah, i never really think about it German in that sense romanticism dying of love exactly swoony thing and actually, it's never the first is, thing I associate with it, but it's absolutely there, and and it's true of this film as well. It's very much in that tradition. I mean, this is a, this is a, a a swoonily romantic film. Nonetheless, it's still told. When I say at a distance, maybe that's not quite fair, but it has. I like the combination of realism with the fairy tale. It reminds me actually of uh, like Let the Right One In or Border, which we saw, which are both Swedish films, they have that kind of... They don't, they're don't. they not florid about their fantasy, they're grounded. Mm. And they say, what if this were in a real-life context, a modern context that we recognise? I think it's very uh, sp sparse and economical, but also very fluid. It moves beautifully. It has a fantastic use of colour and incredibly fluid use of long takes, mm. Yeah, where kind of, you know, the camera's always mobile... But, you know, the character is never out of reach. You know, it's always kind of focused on, on on, the protagonist. But I think it's also sparse in the sense that, you know, it's not florid. You never get more than you need to understand, yeah? Uh, and I love that about the film. Mm. You know, that kind of, you know... So, for example, when the uh, water tank, the fish tank, falls on them, mm. right? And the camera stays a little bit too long, yeah? Mm. So that you make... So that you, you understand the moment and its significance, yeah, and kind of what it means, right? So it doesn't cut away quickly. It lingers on those faces kind of coming to life, yeah, or coming yeah. awake. It uh, makes a lot of its actors' faces. Yes. I was really struck by the tears in uh, Undina's eyes when she goes to see Christoph in the hospital and she's told he's brain dead, and then she's also told that you didn't have this phone conversation with him yesterday. He was already in hospital at that mm. point. And she can't believe it and she's distraught because of the condition he's in the look on her face and the tears in her eyes and she's unblinking they're just mm. they're filling up her eyes is really striking actually really amazing mm. she's wonderful uh she's wonderful because all her emotions are transparent right mm. but there's also something about just her face she's so beautiful you know that coloring with those like gr green gray eyes yeah it has you know, kind of a particular luminosity or something, really. And then the shade of her hair and her skin, I think she's kind of, you know, uh, fascinating to watch. It's a face that's alive, you know. Um, so, I mean, I thought that was tremendous. I mean, I think this is a truly great film, actually. I, mean, I, have I to didn't think, think it was truly great. I do. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's my first impression. Obviously, you never know until you, you see it again and you work it through properly and so on. But I loved it. Yeah. I, and I, I was like... surprised to. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Why? Well, um, because I remember feeling as intensely about uh, Transit, by mm -hmm. the way, which I thought was also great. Except then I realized I'd forgotten most of it. You right. Know? Uh, and then I saw he did um, a version of The Postman Always Wins Twice, mm -hmm. which is a noir, and which, you know, I liked... But again, the ones that really stick in my memory, really, is, you know, the Lana Turner, John Garfield version. I think this shares with Transit, it's a personal story set amongst a very explicit, although less explicit here, but still explicit, socio-political backdrop, mm. which is where all of those lectures come in, all of that talk about the history of mm. Berlin. Well, you see, I love that also, because I think it's a cinema of ideas, yeah, and it uses myth, and on the other hand, is also palpably sensual. Mm. Yeah, and it's a combination of those three things. Mm. Yeah, you know, kind of used in combination that I think it makes it like really, 
rare and, and beautiful. Yeah, you know, so it's beautifully realized. So it's not just using those components, it's actually, you know... Expressing. Expressing them beautifully. Yeah, mixing them beautifully to express. Mm. Nonetheless, there was something about it, and maybe it's in comparison with Transit, which felt more potent to me. There's something about this that felt like a trifle. Um, no, I didn't think so. You know, maybe I just didn't connect with the love story so much as I mm. did the political story. But I had a love story too, which I did connect with, and maybe it was the, the, the much stronger... Mm. Yeah, a political backdrop to that that's that made that film more powerful to me maybe i just felt it was a better film um well i don't know because as i said i mean some of these things i still have to work but my first impression is that you know you get the thing about love and history and placement you know and the being that they're being placed and the reusing of places but you know kind of places needing spaces and spaces not always kind of being available at particular times because you know, the creation of spaces also has to do with ideas. And then how this also can be related to people and types and species <laughs> in the film. Yeah, like, you know, so I think, and of course that can be read metaphorically as well, right? Uh, so I, 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 I loved it. I should have known you'd love it because you love The Shape of Water and it's that, but in German. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, actually this is so much um, sparser and economical you know, there's no special effects. The closest you get to a special effect is, you know, that play with the image type at the end when they're underwater, you know, and it's obviously meant to take on a more mythic... Silent movie imagery. That's really yes. what they look like. Yes. Let's put that portraiture you get in silent movies. Yes. Uh, so, and it's very beautiful and it's very expressive. Mm. Uh, so, I loved it. Good. I liked it. <laughs> don't let's go overboard on these things I'm calling it as I see it uh, so I think he's one of the most interesting directors working in Europe today mm. I highly recommend I recommend <laughs> I'd, I'd, but I'd see I'll Transit write. first yeah, Transit is brilliant there's a reason not to see both uh, no, that's true. I did like in this just quickly I've quickly remembered um, I did like in this the lampshade hanging on speaking German at the start, which is something you normally get in English language films. Where actually we saw this in Shang Chi yesterday, mm. where um, you have characters who should be speaking a different language to English. So in that mm. they should be speaking Mandarin, and they were quite a lot. But also it's an English language film. Ultimately, it's an English audience mm. that you're going to be kind of putting it out to. So you want as much English language as possible. Mm. So you'll have the character say, "Do you mind if we speak in English?" Mm. In that you had the dad saying, "Have you been practicing your English?" Mm. As a way of basically telling the audience, oh yeah, there's context for the oh, English move that English, we're speaking. Okay. And um, it also happened in Inglorious Bastards, in a way, at the start of that film, in the scene with the farmer, uh, you had Hans Lander, the Jew hunter, saying to the farmer, I understand you speak English, could we speak in English? And it really just makes no sense why he would do that. And actually later it's contextualised as him saying, the Jews that I know are hiding under your floorboards, they don't speak English, they don't understand what we've been talking about. It makes sense of that. And in here at the start, do you want them to speak in German? Because it's a German language film. And she says to this group of uh, foreign tourists yes. who are clearly white, Japanese, all over the place. Um, we will be speaking German. Because I understand, <laughs> she says. I understand that you have a good command of German, so we'll speak in German if you don't mind. And mm. it's really great. I like. I, I I always notice when that happens. I always think it's quite funny. Mm. I, but I, I, I find it charming every time. All right. On that note, thank you very much for listening. We're eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on. Apple Podcasts, Audible, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter. And the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much. Be the gem. <laughs>